Well, what are you feeling now as you are in your last weeks here? Um, you know, a lot of mixed feelings. Um, it's kind of bittersweet. It's time to go. I know that. Um, I decided not to run for office again. That's a pretty, had to make quite a decision to do that. Um, and I'm pleased with a lot of stuff we done and there's some things that I wish I had a little bit more time to do. And what's that? So, well, I'm still really troubled by some of those young children who were killed, mm -hmm. particularly in the north side. A couple of them on a trampoline by mm -hmm. gangbangers driving by and shooting out of their car. Mm -hmm. uh, Terrell Mays is one of them. There's others. And that's kind of unfinished business. Those kids and their families deserve justice and we just haven't been able to do that. So there's some regrets like that, but generally, I think I leave a legacy of a very well-trained and professional office committed to justice. We make mistakes, but we do a good job of that. And one of the things I'm trying to do in the last days is kind of rebuild some of the reputation of the office with others, because I think we got somewhat unfairly treated in the crush of events. And this is a good office with good people committed to justice, and I want to make sure that message gets out. What made you want the job in the first place? You know, I don't talk a lot about this, but I'm a Norwegian Lutheran. There's a thing called guilt and duty that comes with that. All sorts of other nationalities and heritages have it, but being in Minnesota, you know, we Norwegians and who are also Lutherans get to claim that. Um, it was the sense of duty. Um, it's something I was very interested in. I was really committed to justice. I knew it was hard work, but I thought I had the capacity to help work through all sorts of extraneous facts to what really happened and demand that we do the right thing. Um, so it took um, a real commitment and a willingness to do that. I laughingly c consider myself the offensive lineman of life. That's what I was in college and high school. And you have a sense of duty, you have a job to do, and you go do it. And that's what we've done. What was the conversation like with your father when you told him that you wanted to throw your hat in the ring for this job? Um, this one was easier than the first one, when at age 29, I advised him I wanted to run for the United States Congress. And his first comment to me that you're too young, and my second comment to him, how old were you when you ran for Attorney General, sir? And he was 30. And I was going to be 30 while I was running. So that kind of answered that. Mm -hmm. um, I think he, uh, we did politics with dad as a family, and he helped me a lot in this. and. My family has done this with me. So that's just kind of a, a family tradition. And um, we believe in public service deeply. And uh, without their help, I couldn't have done it. When you used to walk into the state capitol, you would pause and take a look at his uh, portrait there? Yeah. Um, what, what would you think in those moments? I would most often flash back to walking into the capitol with him because he took me a lot. Um, I got to sit in the corner and listen, and they were great lessons. So I remembered those times, and I remembered the, uh, the challenges he faced, some that were very hard personally and to the family. The strike in Albert Lee when he called out the National Guard to close the plant, not keep it open, which was unheard of, because he felt the workers had rights just like the owners and the employers did. And uh, he was very proud of that, and, and so am I. So you think a lot about things he did and the standards he kept, and something you tried to maintain yourself. And what other ways did he influence you as a public figure and as a holder of a, a major office? The awesome responsibility, the, the absolute dedication to trying to do the right thing, the humility to knowing you're not always able to do the right thing and being able to have the courage and the honesty to acknowledge that. And I think I've done that here and I've talked with people here. 
you know, when I arrived, I started talking about us making sure we did the right thing every day and everything we did. And some of the grizzled veterans were kind of laughing behind my back. Who does he think he is and how does he know this? I don't know always what the right thing is to do, but I'm determined to find it out. Mm -hmm. And now it's very rewarding to hear the new hires, because virtually every lawyer in this office I've hired now over 24 years. Mm -hmm. And they talk about it and they believe in it, and that's a major accomplishment as far as I'm concerned. When you made the choice to uh, run for governor, it seemed like the natural progression of things. Uh, and. Was it was it very disappointing that it didn't work out, or or how did how did you take that? Oh, I was crestfallen. Um, it was very difficult. You know, in Minnesota, you could only run for one office at a time, which I agree with. Uh, you know, in Wisconsin and Texas, you can run for two offices at the same time, and I wouldn't be so pretentious to try to do that. But when I ran for governor in 1998. Um, I knew I was giving up this job, which I cared a lot about. Um, but I thought I could do more for the things I believed in. And, you know, I'm a Minnesotan through and through, and I thought there were some things I could contribute. But all of a sudden, not only did I lose an election, but I'm out of a job. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had to go back and practice private law, which is an honorable profession. It's not exactly what I wanted to do. But I got a break when then... Hennepin County Attorney Amy Klobuchar decided to run for the United States Senate, and I said, yippee, I get to go back and <laughs> try to earn my old job back. And when you were reelected then, had you figured out in your head that this is, this is my path now, and this is, at, at that point, did you still have aspirations for a different office? No. Or was it, so I had, so I had, talk about your mindset as you come back into the job. Well, as I came back in the job, I was relieved and pleased to be here because there's great responsibilities and it requires a lot of your ability. And I believe in the criminal justice system and I know it can make mistakes. And I know sometimes people have made deliberate mistakes or abused it, which is unacceptable. But, you know, I went to law school and I clerked for two federal judges and truth and reaching out for justice was always very important to me. And I was really glad to come back and do that. And I was particularly pleased to see when I had my first management committee meeting and of the people on the committee, I had appointed all of them more than eight years before and, and Klobuchar had added one person. So I had a good team to start with. And that's really a key here. That's something that's really not well understood. You know, we charge over 9,000 adult felonies a year, and some were around 4,000 juvenile cases. There's no way the county attorney, him, her or himself, can be involved in all those decisions. You've got to hire good people, you've got to set standards, and you've got to be there to help make the tough ones. But, you know, I was having a case counseled on a case yesterday, you know, two weeks before I leave, mm -hmm. about what's the right thing to do in this case. And I value talking with the, the trial lawyer, her supervisor, and our manager in that area, as well as Judge Mabley, who is now, you know, my chief criminal deputy. Mm -hmm. And lots of experience and lots of thoughtfulness. And we came to a decision. That's interesting and exciting work. And it's work that's got to be taken very seriously. How has this office changed over the years? It's much bigger. It's more, the cases are more complex. The scrutiny is much higher. Uh, they watch everything we do. Um, and that's probably not a bad thing. Um, what we don't have that we need to have is the kind of respect and support from all members of the community. Um, we lost some of that when we, and particularly me, made some decisions not to charge police officers with criminal actions in, in cases that, young, that involved young African-American males. Jamar Clark is the classic example, mm -hmm. the hardest case I've had. But the evidence simply wasn't there that the cops acted in a criminal manner. I didn't like how they acted. Mm -hmm. They didn't need to pull their gun when they did. They didn't need to take down Clark the way they did. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and there was other things they could have done. But there was not evidence that they acted in a criminal manner. That's the decision that a number of senior prosecutors and I arrived at here. That's the same decision that Andy Luger made as the United States Attorney. And yet I was roundly criticized. And there were stories made up about evidence that supposedly was there that simply wasn't. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. Some people said, well, he was handcuffed at the time he was shot. That simply isn't true. He never had handcuffs on. Mm -hmm. There's no abrasion in his wrists. And you always have that when cuffs are put on, almost always. Uh, the cuffs were many feet away from where his body was found. Um, there was no indication the cuffs were taken off out of the belt by the cops, and they were going to start to do that at the time the tussle occurred mm -hmm. and the shots were fired. But it didn't matter. A couple of people said, well, they saw that. And that was truth. It wasn't. There was insufficient evidence of that. Years ago, that determination of the weight of the evidence that didn't happen would have been accepted. Now, because of the lack of credibility of the police and, frankly, the whole criminal justice system, including prosecutors, it's still truth for some people in the street, even though it's false. So um, I was there for the the announcement for the Jamar Clark case and the presentation, and that was after you had announced that I'm not gonna have the grand jury do this, I'm gonna make this decision, and you gave a presentation of why you made the decision. Were you caught off guard that the reaction was what it was among uh, people that disagreed with it? I was surprised, you know, off guard is a different, I was surprised, I thought that I knew there were strong feelings. I thought when the explanation that we gave which was extensive, the questions I answered, uh, the fact that we put a detailed report up on our website, people look at it, it's like it didn't matter. People were not as interested in what the real facts were. They were interested in what their perceptions were. And there's, you know, police department still has a lot of work to do um, in terms of being transparent. But I decided that the county attorney ought to make that decision and not a grand jury because we are transparent and we are accountable. And the, my accountability was people in the streets outside my house yelling at me. Um, I'm not certain I, I made better decisions the days after I got no sleep, but um, you know, they, that's what they did. And, and I feel bad about that. It's not a new it's a phenomenon special to Minnesota. Mm -hmm. It's happened all over the country. The, the DA in Sacramento had happened to. The DA in Boston had happened to. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of the period of the times. And some of the review and insistence on better police practices is appropriate. The rise of uh, the police accountability and social justice movement kind of coincided with crime in general at that time being at a pretty low spot. Yes. Um, so were you surprised that it got the, the amount of focus that it did among the community? I mean, it's, it still gets it now, but now the crime rates have risen again, so the, the crime is getting a, a focus as well. I was surprised that, that I'd spent my career going to community meetings and consulting with people and having task forces and listening to folks. I was surprised at the level of, uh, of demonstration and communication and the virulent nature of it. Um, I wasn't surprised that there would be strong disappointments. Mm -hmm. And um, the, I felt that we were being so transparent in providing all this information that people would stop and look at it. And I'm afraid a lot of people didn't. Um, you know, looking back afterwards, you know, I wish I had done more community work. My problem was when I went out to do something, I'd get shouted off the stage, which isn't really necessary part of what we do to understand each other. We're supposed to listen and have discussions. And I had a lot of good discussions, but they had to be in private. And a lot of people um, we just weren't willing to, to listen. And that's really how things have changed. Now, let me just correct something that you said. I'm very encouraged with the work of Operation Endeavor, which is Commissioner of Public Safety Alexander's concept and idea. 
We've embedded a prosecutor there. I'm very encouraged with Minnesota Heals 2.0, which I put together, which included not only cops and prosecutors and judges, but the faith community and the business community. And those two efforts combined that crime in Minneapolis now is down. Carjackings are down 67%. Shots fired are down over 30%. Homicides are down. So it's like the crime wave has hit its peak and is coming down, which is, to me is very encouraging. Mm -hmm. And again, this isn't unique to Minnesota. It's happening else everywhere in the country. And when I talked to my sister and brother prosecutors from all over the country, and I had the privilege to be the president of the National District Attorneys Association, all of us are facing much of the same. Nobody got quite the pushback we did with the tragic death of George Floyd. Mm -hmm. But perhaps Minneapolis had it coming. And that also kind of set the wave like for everyone else. But um, I think we've turned the corner. We've got a lot of work to do yet. But I'm pleased that we've done that with some creative new ideas. Your office did obtain the first criminal conviction for a, a homicide on duty by an officer in the Muhammad Noor case. Was that Yes, sir. And was that something you were proud the of? Best, the best we can tell for at least the last 40 years, that's the first homicide mm -hmm. conviction. Mm -hmm. Now, I've convicted other cops of, of sexual misconduct, of theft, of assault, and other things. But this is the first cop who used deadly force in a criminal manner and was found guilty. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a major breakthrough. Um, Along with Attorney General Ellison, we put together a joint team that convicted um, Derek Chauvin appropriately and the other three officers. So we got justice across the board, mm -hmm. um, but it took a while, and um, there's not a whole lot of patience out there by some folks about how long justice takes if it's going to be done right. Um, more broadly now, what are your proudest accomplishments as county attorney? The biggest one is the quality of the staff that we've hired, we've trained, we've mentored, we've given responsibility, they've grown. In the last 10 years, members of the Hennepin County Attorney, 17 members of the Hennepin County Attorney's Office have been named judges, 17. And of that 17, 10 have been judges of color. So we've gone, when I arrived here in 1991, we had three or four lawyers of color. Today we have 30% of our lawyers. And we worked real hard at that. And I'm really proud. Our numbers would be better, but for the fact that these governors keep appointing our best folks to be judges. Mm -hmm. But you know, it makes you very proud to see Justice McKaig, the first native woman on a Supreme Court in the state, in not only the state of Minnesota, but in the country. And Juanita Freeman being the first black woman judge in Washington County. Um, and, and again and again and again, you look at the number of judges of color. So our bench is beginning to respond and reflect the society just like this county attorney's office has done. That's not by accident. Mm -hmm. We've worked real hard. I'm really proud of that. I guess the other thing is kind of uh, disproving a negative. We haven't had a scandal here. We haven't had a situation where um, a county attorney was accepting money. We didn't We've tried cases that we've learned subsequently the evidence wasn't there. We've had cases when the police didn't tell us the full story and we had to back off it. There's those kind of mistakes were made. But this is a just and honorable office and we've worked hard at that and, and I'm proud of that record because that's, that's hard to do and hard to maintain. Do you have a quote unquote one that got away? Oh, um, you know, we've never had enough to charge the killers of some of these kids. If something got away, that, you know, the case when the kid was shot in the backseat of dad's car and dad was shooting the other people and they were having a gunfight with his kids in the back. Mm -hmm. We've never been able to put that one together. The kids in the trampoline, um, you know, some of those others. Um, no, you know, I'm, I'm a father of five. My kids are doggone important to me. I can't imagine going through life without them. 
and to lose these kids and never have any justice. Um, we worked really hard in those cases. And, you know, we've had some, you know, uh, like the Westroom case recently, a cold hit rape and murder case that was 25 years old and was picked up from DNA that came from the napkin of somebody eating a hot dog at a hockey game. Mm -hmm. That shows what we can do in technology. Mm -hmm. So we've had some big successes like that, but the ones that still haunt me are some of the rape cases and particularly the homicides of kids. Um, where do you see the future of this office? Um, you know, obviously, Mary Moriarty was elected, and some people think it will go in a, people don't really know what direction it's gonna go in, I guess. <laughs> Where do you see the future of this office going, and what do you tell your staff when they ask you? As I said to Mary, and it's pretty well known, the other candidate, Martha, former Judge Martha Holton Dimmick, was my candidate, the one I supported. She lost, Mary won. And in this country, I believe in elections, and they're decided, and the elect, the person who wins, is going to be the office holder. And so I called Mary at 10 o'clock on Tuesday night to congratulate her and say we'd work hard on a successful transition. And we've worked hard at doing that. Um, there are people who say, well, Mary has said this or Mary has said that. Well, I know I became a more responsible person when I was elected, when I learned about the job and what it had to do. And I've seen folks, as all of us have, people who've been appointed judges and you say, what is this? How is this person going to be a just person? This person says this or does that. People grow into the offices that they hold. Um, and I expect no less of Mary. I think people expected no less than me. They expected it of Tom Johnson when he was elected. They expected it of Amy Klobuchar when she was elected. And I think we we're all much more responsible people um, when we were here and found out what the people required. So I have every reason every faith that this office will continue to seek justice and do the right things. There will be some policy changes. That's what an elected county attorney gets to do. But um, this is a big, huge battleship. And you don't turn it around or make it move in profound ways easily or quickly. And, and frankly, this office, like everywhere else, can use some change and some new, fresh breath. 24 years is long enough. I've been pleased to be here that long, but it was time to go. And uh, I'm prepared on January 3rd to climb, go down to the, the ground level. I've rented a pumpkin to climb into, to gonna go off into the sunset on my pumpkin. Well, what are your plans in retirement? The first plan is not to make any significant decisions for at least nine months. I'll start thinking about what I wanna do next after Labor Day 2023. For 50 years, I've gotten up in the morning, put a tie on, and gone to the law office. It's time to do something different. So I don't anticipate doing a law job. But there's a lot of interesting things out there. But I'm going to take my time and figure it out. 